Hypertension has become more of a concern these days. It's actually one of the most prevalent cardiovascular diseases. And most people who have it don't even know they have it. And those who do have really an inadequate, often really inadequate control over it. Today, we are so pleased to host Dr. Maria Amelia, a cardiologist from Brazil, who has done some interesting research on gratitude, forgiveness, spirituality, and its effect on hypertension. I'm Andrea Spiros. I'm a behavior design consultant and a professional speaker, and I work with organizations to harness the power of high performance habits, increasing engagement, resilience, and overall well being. I am Dr. Shabnam Daskar, a functional medicine doctor and Tiny Habits certified coach. I teach people how to improve their focus, get rid of brain fog, and reduce their risk of dementia down the line. And today, welcome, Dr. Amelia, uh, Maria Amelia. We're so pleased to have you today. Please share with us. There's a lot we want to unpack about your your research. Please share with us with us what got you interested in doing this type of research. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Dr. Shabnan. It's my privilege to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to bring the results of our latest research, the results from the field trial that we presented recently at the late breaking clinical trials of the ACC24. So we started to research this theme uh, in 2020 because uh, as a cardiologist, I'm very intrigued about the situation of hypertension in Brazil and in the whole world. As you said, it's uh, a prevalent disease with inadequate control, bringing lots of death worldwide. And uh, we know there is a gap. Uh, we know how to treat it with uh, lifestyle habits, medications, but still it's not adequately treated. And why isn't it treated? What, and what else is influencing those blood pressure controls that we're not looking at and is avoiding us from having good control? I know that uh, we're not taking, we, I say as a population, but uh, hypertensive patients are not uh, treating themselves well, are not looking at themselves, are not measuring their blood pressures and are not taking their pills adequately, are not uh, having good lifestyle habits. And what about their behaviors, their feelings? I think they're not working on that either. So I started to look at those, the influence of those feelings and we got good results on this research that we call the field trial. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maria. So the trial that Dr. Maria is talking about, and she had presented at the American College of Cardiology uh, very recently, I think it was just last week. And the name of the trial, so Andrea, this is for people who want to know what it is that, um, that the trial is. The name of the trial is a clinical trial to evaluate the influence of a spirituality intervention on blood pressure control Central Hemodynamics and Endothelial Function. And it has a very interesting acronym, FEEL, F-W-E-L, FEEL trial. So, um, Dr. Maria, interesting thing is, uh, I know your specialty is you're a cardiologist, and which is this place in Brazil that you uh, you work, out, work at, your institution? I work and research at the Hypertension Unit of the Federal University of Goiás. Goiás is a state in the center of Brazil, very close to Brasilia, our capital. And this work, as you said, the acronym Phil, is the work I did for my PhD. It's my PhD thesis, recently ended. Oh, wow. So in the, uh, in the, thesis, in the subject title, there are two terms. I think, doc, Dr. Maria, I'd, I'd like you to explain it for, the, for our audience. One is central hemodynamics and the other one is endothelial function. So what is central hemodynamics? Okay, uh, central refers to the central vessel, central arteries. So we evaluated the blood pressure in the aorta. We have a device that measures it, not invasively, 
but we can estimate the blood pressure on the aorta. And uh, this is an important information because we may measure blood pressure in our arms, also, I mean, uh, peripheric, but we, we must know how this blood pressure is on the central vessels. So first of all, this is what we research. The second term, endothelial function, refers to the function of the inner layer of the arteries, that's called endothelium. This inner layer, the endothelium, is responsible for many things, but specifically here for the FU trial, we studied its capacity of dilating the vessels, the arteries, if necessary. Why do we study that? Because when the, the arteries get uh, sick, they get rigid, they get stiff, and they do not dilate. So we, in this endothelium is responsible for when it knows that the endothe the, the organism, I'm sorry, the organism is in ischemia. I mean, there is not enough uh, blood to bring oxygen and nutrients. This endothelium is responsible for uh, liberating nitric oxide into the circulation. And this uh, substance will make the, the vessels dilate to bring more blood. So when the vessel is sick, is rigid, is stiff, it does not dilate, even though there is this liberation of nitric oxide. And we can study this function with this uh, technique called flow-mediated dilation that evaluates the diameter of the artery. Uh, and then after five minutes of ischemia, we can uh, measure again this vessel. If its uh, diameter is at least 10% more than the beginning uh, before the ischemia, we have a normal uh, vessel. If it dilates less than that, it's a stiff vessel, so a sick vessel. That's what we studied uh, together with blood pressure measurement. So uh, just a little clarification. So what Dr. Maria is talking about, the blood pressure in the aorta. The aorta is the big blood vessel that goes from the heart and supplies blood to all the different organs in the body. And this uh, this aortic blood pressure is not routinely measured. So, Dr. Maria, is that mostly a research tool? Because if I go to the doctor, you know, my family doctor, he or she is not going to measure my aortic blood pressure. Uh, and endothelial function that you mentioned is basically one of the earliest problems that happens in someone who, who is at risk for heart disease and stroke. And it's also, interestingly, the problem in a lot of men with erectile dysfunction, but we are not going into all that today. But basically, what I want to highlight is, in your study, you looked at things way more than only blood pressure. And the blood pressure was, was it like 24-hour uh, ambulatory, or was it home blood pressure, or was it in-office blood pressure measurement? We had uh, in-office blood pressure and also home, home blood pressure monitoring. Central blood pressure uh, was measured with a non-invasive device, as I said, mm -hmm. and the endothelial function was done, uh, measured with a robotic device. Uh, that is uh, the gold standard for that. The importance of this parameter is that it is considered the best parameter to evaluate non-pharmacological and short-term interventions like the one we use here. Oh, wow, that is awesome. So next, I think um, Andrea and I are very interested in your paper is on, your research work is on spirituality. So I know your Brazilian Cardiology Society has a definition of what is spirituality because we like to differentiate between spirituality and religiosity. So Andrea, what would you like to say? And then we'll ask uh, Dr. Maria to define. It was a very good, very good and you know, interesting definition of spirituality. Yeah, I think it's important that um, our listeners too understand the, the actual principles that Dr. Maria Amelia has uh, looked at on here. 
in many parts of the world, uh, spirituality is undefined and all, often conflated with being religious. And so for the purposes of Dr. Maria Amelia's study, we know that wasn't necessarily the case. So if you're listening here, uh, we're going to have you, Dr. Mal Maria Amelia, define this for them so that you can understand exactly what she was researching so you can have you can understand more fully the impact of the results and some things that you can do yourself. So please share how you, how the def the de definition, Dr. Maria Amelia. Okay, so spirituality we defined as a set of moral, mental, and emotional values that guide thoughts, behaviors, and attitudes in the life circumstances of intra and interpersonal relationship suitable to scientific evaluation. And that's what we're talking about. Now, we're not talking about, but let's define religion as a organized system of beliefs, practices and symbols designed to facilitate closeness with the transcendent or the divine and foster understanding of one's relationship and responsibilities with others living in the community. And religiosity can be defined as how much an individual believes, follows, and practices a religion. It can be organizational, like going to churches, temples, or religious services, or non-organizational, such as praying, reading books, or attending religious programs. I bring those definitions from uh, the latest Brazilian guidelines of uh, cardiovascular uh, prevention, and there's a whole chapter on spirituality and cardiovascular medicine on that guideline, because uh, the Brazilian Society of Cardiology has a formal scientific department of spirituality and cardiovascular medicine, where we study this theme and uh, we give lectures and conferences. We try to bring this knowledge to the medical education. Wow. Is that the only de cardiology department in the world with a spirituality uh, specialty? Well, I, I don't know if it's the only one because uh, medical schools in the United States have uh, formation on spirituality and medicine, but maybe from scientific society, if it's not the only, it's one of the only ones in the world. The guideline is the first one to to have this theme on it. And we also have from the same Brazilian Society of Cardiology a positioning on hypertension and spirituality, a formal document from the society. Oh, wow, I have to read that. <laughs> so share with us what exactly you practiced in the study or you, had, you, you did in this study to get the effects that you did. I, it's I understand. a very simple intervention, Andrea. Sorry for that. Continue, continue. It's a very simple intervention. We formulated a 12-week intervention containing either one of those four contents, a, a video or a quote for self-reflection or a small task related to the content of the last video or a day off. And uh, all those uh, contents worked on basically four feelings. Forgiveness, gratitude, optimism, and life purpose. So we brought, uh, first we brought definitions from the dictionary. Then we brought information that uh, those feelings can be beneficial for our health. And then we proposed some work on those feelings. Like, for example, asking the participant to write a message for someone he or she must forgive but don't send it. And then ask a message for someone uh, to be forgiven and to forgive him. And uh, later to write a message for someone you're grateful for uh, or write some uh, purposes of life for the next days or for the next years. We tried to stimulate that, to engage the patient on participating by writing the messages. And then later we ask them to send the messages and if they could not tell us why. Well, that's, that's so interesting. So Dr. Maria, 
uh, the participants in the study were, uh, these were people with hypertension, I think you said stage one and stage two. So the definition of hypertension in Brazil, is it the same as we use in the American uh, Heart Association definitions or is it different? It's the same. It's basically okay. the same. So basically stage one is 130 to 139 for systolic. That's the upper number. And the diastolic is 80 to 89. And for the stage two, it is 140 millimeters of mercury or higher and diastolic is 90 or higher. So these were people who were diagnosed with hypertension and they were already on medication, right? Yes, most of them were already on medication. And that's important to say, no changes in the medications were made during the follow-up period, those, during those 12 weeks period. I have just a, a comment on the blood pressure levels. We start on 140 and 90 for stage one hypertension and 160 and 100 for uh, stage two hypertension. Okay, so these patients were actually at a higher blood pressure level than the definitions that we um, use in North America. So that is just important to remember because a lot of the research is like people don't uh, understand because they don't define correctly. So what you are, you actually in a way were looking at people who are at much higher blood pressure levels than the same stage in North America, we would say, because in medicine, so Andrea, you know, yeah. we like to get into the weeds because what is the definition of hypertension for you, you know, versus me? So, but exactly. then it's important to remember that. And the other thing is, uh, Dr. Maria, was this like, did you use an app or was it WhatsApp messages is what I understand? Okay, so our definition of hypertension is uh, stage one starting in 140 systolic and 90 diastolic. And stage two starts at 160 systolic and 100 diastolic. We did not include patients that were in stage three. That's starting on 180 systolic and 110 diastolic obviously because those patients had to have a change in their medications. So definition is that for Brazilian society yeah. of cardiology. We used uh, messages sent through WhatsApp uh, because it was simple. Just send a message. It's a widely used app. Uh, everyone, almost everyone, or at least all the participants had it already installed in their cell phones, knew how to use it. So we used something that was already known by everyone. And we sent those messages daily. Every morning, there was a researcher responsible for sending the messages and getting confirmation that they received that message and uh, for the tasks, getting the answer back. We did not evaluate the content of the answers and we told the participants we would not evaluate that because we did not want to inhibit them. We, are, we wanted them to be free to say whatever they wanted, to really engage in, those, in that proposal. Oh, wow. So you basically sent a, a WhatsApp broadcast because it was the same message to all the 100 participants. Am I right? Yes, that's it. But not and, for the other 100, for 50. Because oh, the sorry, other yeah, because of the control. The control. Yeah. yeah. So and the other thing is these messages, uh, like what I'm trying to figure out is because what you found was really amazing because, and I'm going to ask you about the results that you found, 7.6 millimeters of systolic blood pressure lowering without using a prescription medication. That is like really fantastic. But what I'm trying to understand, Dr. Maria is, so these patients, when you ask them to let us say, write a letter of gratitude, you were not really tracking whether they actually did that, right? We tracked if they did but okay. we did not track the content. Okay, yeah, that, that would be private. I, I'm, I'm... So yeah. did you find any difference between like messages of forgiveness or optimism or gratitude or, uh, you know, meaning versus, like, was there any difference between the different types of messages or whether it was a video or whether it was a text message or 
all of them seem to have the same kind of effect. We did not evaluate that separately. We evaluated just the whole intervention. Wow, that is like, so, you know, what I'm trying to, uh, the impact of this is sending a, you know, a broadcast on WhatsApp is sort of, Andrea, what we would call a one-time action. So, Andrea, will you explain, because uh, Dr. Maria, because yeah. we talk about behavior design, you know, so Andrea will explain what is a one-time action and how easy it is to do it. And if you automate it, it's even easier. Well, I think for, I think the the bigger implications of this are just to pull back a little bit is that these WhatsApp messages were going to individuals and in the individuals in the who were participating were answering them. So they answered, they wrote a gratitude statement, but they maybe didn't send it. They wrote a forgiveness statement, but maybe didn't send it. They were asked to do a task um, and did the task and other tasks around, maybe they watched a video on optimism or other aspects of this. So the, the study focused on optimism, gratitude, forgiveness. And then they had a significant reduction, 7.6, 7 um, re significant re reduction in their systolic blood pressure. This is without changes in medication. And so the impact of this is them is very interesting world with the you know bigger implications for this highly undiagnosed and poorly treated um, uh, blood pressure that people may have and the one-time actions are really just they're prompted by the whatsapp messaging system. So very easy to do. I'm guessing, Dr. Maria Amelia, that it, it didn't take very long. You're not asking them to write a two-page forgiveness letter or spend an hour doing something. So having this system set up can, as actually shown that these simple behaviors can improve your health. And maybe you don't need, if you're listening here, maybe you don't need to wait for someone to text you on WhatsApp. You can put these in place on your daily health regime, right? Write a gratitude message to someone, write a forgiveness message to someone, uh, connect to your life purpose, do a behavior around that. Uh, and the, also the significance is here, you can have as a doctor, your intervention can be set up where you have an automated prompt go to your patients to have them do one of these four things to support them in reducing their hypertension. Yeah. Yes, Indra. So, Dr. Maria, uh, what were the results that you uh, that you found in your study? Yes, we had interesting results. We had a reduction of office systolic blood pressure for intervention group, as you said, 7.6 millimeters, mercury millimeters. Uh, in comparison to control group, it's a 7.1 drop. Uh, with statistical significance. Uh, intervention group also showed a reduction in central systolic blood pressure, but when compared to control group, this was not statistically significant, although it was almost, uh, the P was 0 0.07. And we got a significant improvement in flow-mediated dilation. We got an improvement of four percentage points for the intervention group. Theoretically, and I cannot affirm that, we must research more, but theoretically, each one percentage point of improvement in flow-mediated dilation reduces a nine to 10% in the cardiovascular global risk of the patient. So that's a very interesting improvement in flow-mediated dilation also. That is awesome. And Dr. Maria, the control group were basically on standard of care. So in uh, Brazil, what is the standard of care that, that, that you all recommend? We recommend lifestyle habits modification and uh, we prescribe medicine. Uh, we, of course, uh, we don't know if they do what we recommend about lifestyle habits. Medications, we can ask, and I, they are quite honest if they're taken or not. And uh, all patients uh, were in use of medications, and those medications that they were using in the beginning of the study, 
they used during all those 12 weeks and were using at the last visit. So, and lifestyle habits were uh, the same. The, if they were on exercises at the beginning, they were still on exercises at the end. We asked them about that. And even on the frequency of exercise or alcohol intake or smoking, so uh, we guaranteed that those habits and medications were not changed during, during this period. So uh, the results we got were not due to any changes. Wow, that is, that is fantastic. So uh, Dr. Maria, moving forward, I know you, you have said that um, this is a small study come, considering that there were 50 people in the intervention group. Oh, what is next for you? Where are you planning to take this? Because this is this has huge impact. I mean, reading messages, people are anyway reading uh, good morning messages. And, you know, in Asia, WhatsApp is very common. And every morning I'll find some, uh, you know, good morning this and good morning that. So reading WhatsApp messages are things people are doing anyway. So uh, in the behavior design world, uh, Dr. Maria, we talk about... Uh, you know, we talk about uh, what help people do what they already want to do. So as you said, WhatsApp is something they're already using. So why not just, you know, send use a, use a platform that they're already using and it is free for patients. So yeah, that is fantastic. So where, where do you think this is going next? This is, I'm super excited, <laughs> Dr. Maria, for your, your It's project. thrilling research. It's absolutely thrilling research. Yeah. Yes, it's a, as I said, it's a pilot study. We're still learning how to study uh, the subject because it, it, it's hard to in, make an intervention on feelings. It's easy when you make an intervention on, on pills, you just give a pill, but on feelings, that's hard. So we're working on uh, new feelings to be worked on those patients. And uh, we're thinking about making an app for smartphones containing those messages that should be easier to use. I don't know if easier, but at least uh, easily uh, generalizable. We can uh, put this app uh, available for many people to make uh, larger researches and with longer periods of follow-up because we only had a 12-week then we can think about like six months or one year or a persistent intervention. And so we're thinking about this app and uh, inserting more feelings. And we're thinking about evaluating cardiovascular heart, heart outcomes also, because we only, it's not small, but it's a, an evaluation of blood pressure and flow mediated dilation. We want to study more, should this be, uh, good for other uh, specialties in medicine, like oncology, psychiatry, and whatever other specialties are interested in. We're thinking on working together. That That's is awesome. And this brilliant. is this is so easy to, it, th this would be so easy to scale, right? We are talking about 1.2 billion people with hypertension worldwide. And I have a lot of patients asking me, doctor, can you tell me a natural way uh, to lower blood pressure. Of course, we talk about exercise and all those things, but reading messages or, you know, feeling good about reading something positive is way easier than some of the other interventions in the mind-body space that we've had, which actually required people to change their habits. So this is, thank you, Dr. Maria. This was awesome. And I think, uh, Andrea, I'll let you wrap up. This was fantastic. Uh, much, much gratitude, Dr. Maria Amelia, for sharing the results of your research. We hope you'll come back uh, when you have the next phase so that you can share that with us and our audience. I think, Shabnam, you were uh, highlighted a very important point that most, uh, and m most medication is easy to take, and by all means, we're not telling you not to take it, um, but most natural interventions require you to really break some habits or do some drastic changes that may be very hard for some for people. What this research is showing that incorporating some new positive feeling habits, gratitude, optimism, and focusing on purpose 
can actually ha- impact your health. And it sounds like there's more, you're, you're going to expand this research to beyond hypertension into other things, which will be very interesting to hear. So we'll put Dr. Amelia, uh, Dr. Maria Amelia's information in the show notes so that you can see the study that she did and stay in touch with her and try this at home. Try and see how you feel. You don't need to have high blood pressure to try all these things and share with us what surprised you. If you like this podcast, please like, rate, share, and subscribe. And we look forward to uh, seeing you on the next session. Cheers. Thank you.